holding in Sefer Mishle, Perek Dalet. We're holding Pasuk Yud Dalet, Pasuk 14. Towards the end of chapter 4, Shlomo Melech will advise us on what to do in order to be able to retain all our achievements, in order that we not lose all the hard work that we've uh, been going after. He, he advises of the importance of chokhmah, of pursuing wisdom, learning Torah, acquiring good midot. But it is very easy for one to lose everything that he has gathered, everything that he has accomplished, and to lose is much faster than to gain. It takes a long time to gain, but it's very fast to lose. So towards the end of this chapter, he's going to share with us some very important pieces of information as to what to avoid in order that we not lose all of that. And he begins as follows. Be'orach reshaim al tavo ve'al te'asher bederech ra'im. Do not enter into the path of those who are wicked. Do not go in the way of those who are evil. The idea implied over here is not to associate with people who are corrupt. Even though we may be smart, even though we may have gotten a good education, and we have good values and the proper hashkafot, Rabbis very much expound on this point called Ashpa'ata Hevra, how it is a very powerful influence, the influence of the street, which we spoke about briefly before, how one does absorb a lot of what's going on on the outside, whether it's from friends, from the street, from the environment, and no matter how much he learned and how good he is, be careful not to associate with these individuals, because the environment has the ability to undo everything that one has accomplished. Depending on who one associates with, that is what he may become himself. As the famous saying goes in many languages, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. And why is there such a saying? Because as smart as one can be, as stubborn as one may be, the influence of the environment is much more powerful. There are only very few individuals who can stand up to the environment and not follow the style, the customs and habits of, of what's going on in the streets. One's language is influenced, one's pronunciation is influenced. I'm sure most of you who are many years in the United States can tell if someone's from New York by the way he talks English. Moshe, you can tell where what part of Iran somebody is by listening to his accent, right? Because the area where one grows up has a lot of influence in many areas, in many ways. And therefore, Shlomo Melech reminds us, be careful no matter how good you are and how much you've learned, stay away from bad people. Don't ever say, it won't happen to me, I'm smart, I'm strong, I'll just be their friend, but I'm not going to do what they do. It doesn't work like that. It's very easy to get carried away. And it would be a shame for all that work to be lost. And he tells us like this. The next pasuk reads, Pera'eu alta avorbo seteme ala ve'avor. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, pass away. Various words here that mean the same, but they're conveying different ideas. Pera'eu means, do not even consider this way. Even if you have to go a longer road, the shortcut goes through very unclean billboards. Let's take an example, right? Billboards is an example of a terrible influence. We're talking about a bad billboard, a disgusting billboard that we're sometimes forced to look at. You know, when you're driving, it happens that you, you, know, you see things, things that are beyond your control and you can't look away completely because then you lose control of your car. Nevertheless, we do have sometimes control. We have a choice of what, what way to go. I just had a situation in Savon. Okay? I was buying something in Savon, and I was looking for something, and then I saw an aisle. And I was curious to see if there was anything on sale in that particular aisle. And I was going to go through it, and then I said to myself, wait a minute, that other half of the aisle has many magazines, and many of them are not modest. I can easily avoid it. What's the big deal? I'll just go around. And that's what I did, just to avoid going through that aisle. 
or that portion of the al that I knew is no good. Now I could say to myself, it's nothing is going to happen to me. But who can say, who can ever say that he's safe? That nothing is going to happen. That he may just peek at something which is not proper. So he says, Pera'eo, even if you have to take a longer way, do not take the shortcut. Take the longer way so you can avoid all these billboards. <coughs> the next one, the next idea, is expressed by the Gaon of Vilna. That we're not just talking about avoiding all these influences. We're talking about an individual who's working on himself, on a particular characteristic or a habit that he has. He's trying to conquer himself, he's trying to discipline himself. So the Gaon of Vilna says, you don't think you can do it overnight. Don't ever attack the Yetzer head on. One of the ways people attack the Yetzer head on and they make a big mistake is when those who want to do Teshuvah, they say, I'm going to commit myself to this, to that, and to this. I'm going to go to Shahrit every day, I'm going to go to Minhai, I'm going to go to Arvid, I'm going to go to Sheol Torah, I'm going to stop smoking and drinking and everything else. Tafasta merubelo tafasta, the rabbis tell us in different words, if you commit yourself to too many things, you'll end up with nothing. Do one thing at a time. And that's what the Gaon of Vilna says, Pera'eo. Pera'eo means slowly let go of it. The next step after you let go of it, Alta Borbo, even incidentally, even once in a while, you'll be able to let go of it too. The next step will be that eventually, Seteme Ala Davora, you will be able to let go of it completely. So the Gaon of Vilna reminds us that that is the way to work on oneself, slowly. Slow progress. It does not happen overnight. You let go of it a little bit, then you're able to avoid it completely. And this is a very important point when it comes to stopping to smoke on Shabbat. Stopping to smoke is very difficult for those who have been smoking for many years. We're not talking about one, two, three cigarettes a day. Two packs a day. You cannot expect anybody to stop smoking overnight. Even though he realizes that he... He's endangering his life. He's seen x-rays of his lungs. He realizes what's going to happen to his family if he dies prematurely. That may not convince him because he's stuck. He's addicted. They call it addiction. Addiction is a form of sickness. So how do we get him out of this sickness? We're not concerned now about addiction during the week. We're concerned about Shabbat. We're talking about someone who seriously wants to observe Shabbat, but he has one problem. He can't stop smoking. So there is a, an additional problem here. There is a Hilul Shabbat. What do we do? To, what do we tell him? Eat, let me eat and drink. Huh? It doesn't help every now. I think, I think the experts are all in agreement that the best way to stop is to let go of one cigarette at a time. This Shabbat, instead of smoking 35 cigarettes, you're going to smoke 30. 30 only. You don't tell him you're not smoking. It's impossible. Even if, he did start, even if he did not smoke, even if he succeeded not smoking this one Shabbat, next Shabbat he, he won't be able to go what back and repeat it. No, so that's what I'm telling you. That we're saying exactly what the experts say. Let go of a little bit. Can you accomplish a little bit? Can you decrease your number of cigarettes from 35 to 30? And the answer is most people can. And that little by little he will eventually decrease his dependency on the nicotine. And that is how he will be helping himself without even the help of doctors, without medication, without psychology, without anything else. If you have the strong willpower, you really have the desire, you care about your family, you care about your life, and you care about the Torah, you care about Shabbat, we're able to, to work around the situation. It's going to take time. Don't think you're such a macho that you're going to do it in one Shabbat, in one day. Do it a little bit of a time, and if you do it a little bit at a time, you'll be able to do so. That's one of the ideas expressed in these stages of Pera'eu al Tavor Bosteme ala Davor, let go of these ways little by little until you can eventually avoid it completely. Next Pasuk, Kilo Yishnu im lo yareu natam im lo yakshilu. He's talking about evil and he's explaining why is evil or why is all these forces and all these influences so powerful. Where does it come from that it's so powerful that it can, it can bring down any man? And he says that for they cannot sleep until they have done evil deeds. Their sleep is taken away unless they cause someone to fall. Evil is so powerful that it's not content by just doing evil. Part of the nature of evil is to cause others to do evil too. So but intrinsically, the nature of evil is powerful because 
it wants to bring others to do evil too. It's not just content and it doesn't stop when it does evil itself. It's actually going after others. As the Kabbalah explains, the Tum'ah tries to occupy any inch that is available in this universe where there was once upon a time Kiddushah. It wants to take over. It's a very powerful force that we need to reckon with. It is dangerous. It's after us. In other words, if we sit there and do nothing, it's going to go after us. In other words, you don't have to ask and invite trouble. It's going to come looking for you. It's going to invade your home through the TV, through the internet, through the newspapers, through the magazines. No matter what you do, you have to be very careful. That is the power of evil that it will not sleep. It's an expression describing this power that it wants to cause others to do evil too. It's not content by doing evil itself. And therefore, be careful. It's not something just to take lightly. Oh, I'm strong and I can handle it. No, this is stronger than you are. But there's something good to learn about this. There's something good that we can learn even from evil. What good can we learn from evil? Evil works very, very hard. And Moshe Leib Misasov, great rabbi, Zechet Tzadik Levracha, tremendous rabbi, who one of the things that he used to love to do very much was to try to get Jews out of jail. Pidyon Shvuim, it's a big mitzvah. He used to collect money. I think it was him or it was Rav Levi Yitzhak Mim I want to be fair. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to quote the wrong one. It was one of the two. They were both very much into this mitzvah of helping Jews. And one time the rabbi arrived in town to collect some funds for his big mitzvah, for some mitzvah. And he hears that there is a Jew in jail. What is the Jew doing in jail? He was caught stealing. Unfortunately, you know, there are Jews who succumb to the Yetzer Ara and do all sorts of things. So here we have an, an opportunity, a mitzvah. The community asks him, why don't you go speak to the thief? Why don't you give him some musar? Okay, so he takes advantage of this opportunity, goes to the jail, takes a look at the thief, and he tells him, you see, he doesn't pay to steal. Right? He says, Rabbi, wrong. If I didn't succeed this time, I'll succeed the next time. This time I was caught. The rabbi said, wow, I just learned a tremendous lesson. What, what lesson did he learn from the thief? The rabbi was just about to give up. He was having a hard time collecting funds. People were not helping him out. He was about to go home. And now the thief told him, if you don't succeed today, try and try again. And eventually you'll succeed. No, even from a thief you can learn, even from evil. Your evil works so hard to get people. Just look at all the advertisement. How many millions of dollars they put into advertisement? Obviously because it works. People see that Coca-Cola, you know, they're going to go and rush out to, to have a Coca-Cola. Apparently, they know how to manipulate human minds. And a lot of people are susceptible, they're weak, and they go for it. Just look at all the women who follow the latest style. Somebody in Paris decided that this is going to be the style for this summer and everybody's out there buying that particular style. Why? Just because somebody there decided, and it, 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 that's what it is. There's one individual, or maybe two or three, that decided this is what the style should be and all the women in the world are going to have to dress like that. Please, I'd like to know if there's any women out there who's not going to listen. I don't know of any. I really don't know. <laughs> They all very much feel that they have to follow the style. That's the style. It was dictated in Paris. That's the way it works. They know that they have the power to manipulate and to convince people whatever they want. That is why communication, the radio, the television is so powerful. And if people are not learned, they really believe that the one who's talking the radio knows what he's talking about. That what he's saying is the truth. And it's usually a bunch of lies. Nothing true comes out from most magazines or newspapers. They're all biased, they all have an agenda. They want to influence you with their thought. Very few are neutral. They'll give you the dry news as it is, without having some of their ideas intermingled with what is being written. The next pasuk, this evil, why is evil so that people who get involved in it have a hard time letting go of it. And that is explained in the next Pasuk. Ki lechem resha v'yayin hamasim yishtu. 
For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. Shlomo Melech compares evil to food. Food, once you eat it, you taste it, you get used to it, you don't want to let go of it. So he says, all these wicked people, the reason why they're stuck is because habits are difficult to let go. Something that you enjoy, you've gotten used to, it's like food. If this is your favorite food, if you got used to it, it's hard to change. So the, the idea over here is, these individuals have simply gotten used to bad habits. And because of that, they have a hard time letting go of it. He compares the food, the food that he's talking about over here, to Yen Hamasim. Yen Hamasim, the wine, the wine of violence. But Hamasim really means a robbery, of stealing. And the commentaries explain that those who steal from others, even though wickedness has many names and many ways in which it is expressed, all sorts of violence, whether it's the desires one has, or whether it's money, regardless, it's all evil. The commentators explain the reason why people get so stuck up with stealing and cheating, it's all the same, is because they lack bitachon in Hashem. If they would have true bitachon, true reliance in Hashem, that He provides sustenance to everybody in this world, He takes care of everybody's livelihood, they wouldn't think of stealing or taking from others. So part of the problem when it comes to stealing, at least, is that these individuals do not have enough bitachon Hashem. As we've explained many, many times, a lot of Jews have emunah. They believe God created the world, but they don't really believe that He manages the world, that He takes care of us, He will provide for us. They really think that if they work on Shabbat, they'll, have, they'll make more money. Which goes against the, what the Torah says, that there's no blessing in Shabbat if you work on Shabbat. right? Besides that one is desecrating the Shabbat. People live a life of contradiction. Imagine somebody who does not observe Shabbat, comes on Simchat Torah, picks up the Sefer Torah and dances and kisses it. I mean, that's... What's the best word to describe his action? Sviot, huh? Hypocrisy. You are stepping over, you're trampling this Torah, and now you're kissing and picking it up and dancing with it? People live a life of contradictions. Bitachon is therefore very important midah. It would help someone avoid a lot of trouble. You, one who has true bitachon in Hashem will not be jealous of others because he knows Hashem gave him what he's supposed to get. He knows that this is what is good for him. He knows that everything is min Hashemayim. It could be a kapara, an atonement, regardless of the reasons. But everything is min Hashemayim, except for Yirat Shemayim, obviously, except for our own behavior, our own mitzvot or averot. So part of the problem of this evil, we're talk, not necessarily talking about goyim here, Jews, is that they get caught up in all these acts because of a lack of bitachon, a lack of reliance in Hashem. A lot of, you know who has this problem very much? Gamblers. People who gamble. It's a surah going to the alakhat to gamble on a regular basis. You once in a while you want to play bingo, that's fine. But gambling, going to Vegas regularly and trying to make your money from gambling is not permissible according to the alakha. And one who does so for a living, or one who does so on a regular basis, is not eligible to be a witness. He's disqualified from being a kosher witness. Whether it's gambling in the casino, through poker, or whether it's playing the horses. It's the same thing. Trying to make a fast buck, as they say in English. This is not the way to do it. He has no bitachon. So he's, no bitachon. He's trying to make it in, in, in any other possible way except the clean way. That's also lack of bitachon. Alright, the next pasuk. The path of the just is like the shining light that shines more and more until full day. And the way of the wicked is like darkness. They know not at what they will stumble. There's a big difference, therefore, he says, between the way of the tzaddik and the way of the rasha. The way of the tzaddik is compared to a line, to a light that begins to shine in the morning and becomes brighter and brighter with time until it reaches midday. In other words, a tzaddik, the orach of the tzaddikim, the ways of the tzaddikim, is like the light. It begins to shine and become brighter, meaning that eventually, at some point, because they follow the right path, eventually everything makes crisp, is crystal clear. Everything makes sense. They're sitting on a solid footing. Things are unclear at the very beginning. When one is trying very, very hard to, be, to, to perfect himself, to become a tzaddik, things are not clear to him. 
Uh, but it's like a light, like the light of the dawn. Eventually, it's, it's dark in the beginning. It's not as there's not that much clarity. But eventually, the, if you follow the way of the tzaddikim, you will see that it all makes sense. You will see that their life is much more blessed. You will see the nahat, the happiness and satisfaction that they have with their children sitting around their table. Look at the life of Rasha. The kids have left the home. They don't want to have anything to do with their dad. I just spoke to a, a non-Jew from Cuba. And this guy is, you know, collecting. He was collecting metals to recycle, to make a few dollars. Very simple guy from the street. But he was explaining how he disciplined his boys to be honest people. How he, he went out of his way, even though he was not so rich, to pay for their education. And today the kids always remind their daddy, Daddy, we love you. We appreciate everything you've done for us. We're not amongst the gangs anymore. We are doctors. They're all doctors and important people. They got a degree because the, the father insisted on certain things. So they came go in a certain derech. Eventually it becomes crystal clear where they're holding. But Rashaim go kafila. It's all dark to them. They don't know where they're going to stumble. Because they have no clear takhlit. They don't have a goal. This is very typical of politicians. Politicians are in darkness. They don't have a clear goal because they're always thinking of themselves. Even though they promise you everything, they want to be voted, they want to be chosen, they want to have a position of power, but in the end they don't help you out, they help themselves. This is all darkness. There's no takhlit. They don't know where they're going to stumble. And the reason why he says they don't know where they're going to stumble is because many times they have a plan and who cancels their plan? Akadosh Baruch Hu Mefir Atzatam and that is why it, they're compared to being always going in darkness not knowing where they're going to stumble as opposed to the tzaddik who knows where he's holding he always knows where he's holding just like the light becomes brighter and brighter things become clearer to him too there's a very important Musara scale in this Pasuk Rabbis tell us in the Kabbalah that the human being is called Holech or Mehalech. He's walking. And what that means is that man advances. He's supposed to progress. He's not only supposed to mature and grow physically and emotionally, but spiritually too. He's always Mehalech. He's always moving. But moving could be backwards too. And the rabbis tell us that the human being at never, never at any point in his life is he always the same. We are all different this year from last year, either for the better or for the worse, but we're different. I remember when I went to Yeshiva in Israel, they told me, you're going to go to Israel, to good Yeshiva, Bezat Hashem, you're going to spend some time there, you're not going to come back the same. Israel has a tremendous koach, the rabbi tells in the Gemara, Abira dar ad Yisrael machkima. The air in Israel makes you smart, <coughs> unless you're living in the air of Aza. You know, in certain parts, the air over there may be... <laughs> With the Arabs, it's different. But for the most part, the air all over Eretz Israel is very, very special. Because of the tremendous amount of Kiddushah, one feels and notices the difference when he's learning there. It's, it's incredible. Everybody who went to learn there will testify that his learning there was much better. Anybody that comes back from Yeshiva in Israel, I guarantee you, either is better, a lot better, or is a lot worse. He deteriorated. Because just like there's a lot of Kiddushah there, there is also a lot of Tum'ah. Wherever there is more Kedushah, there is more of a struggle from the Tum'ah to take over. So anybody that goes there, we, it's, it's known. It's, and everybody will tell you this. You either come back much, much better, especially if you spend two, three years, not one year. Or Halila, there is a inter- deterioration spiritually. Man never stays the same. On Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we're supposed to examine ourselves and see how far have we gone. What did we accomplish and what needs to be corrected? Because if we don't make this reckoning, if we don't examine our deeds, we, we don't know what to do, how to become better, what to fix. But this is a very important point here. We're, we don't always stay the same. It's like the light. We're supposed to become brighter and brighter. In other words, we're supposed to progress. Next pasuk. My son, attend to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. Here... Shlomo Melech reveals to us something in addition to the influence of the environment that we spoke about, something called Zehirut. Anybody who learns Musar will be introduced to this idea called Zehirut. Zehirut means caution. 
There's another very important midah called zerizut, diligence. But first comes zehirut. Zehirut means you have to be careful. If something is important to you, you don't want to break something, you're going to be careful with it. A lot of people do not take an avon, a sin, seriously. And therefore they're not careful. If somebody would be careful, then he wouldn't make mistakes as often. There's something called in Hebrew poshea. Poshea means negligent. Rabbis tell us anybody who did something out of negligence, not unintentionally, not be shogeik or be honest, but upasha, peshea ze karov lemezid. Somebody who's negligent that's close to doing something intentionally. Because why did you do it negligently? Because you didn't care about it as much. You didn't learn about it. Had you learned, you would have been more careful. You would be more aware of your actions. So you were a poshea. That's not too good. Pay close attention to my words, meaning be careful, be cautious. All of this is very important. And one who is cautious will not be lazy. The two go together. Because he's, he's always aware of what's going on. A person who's lazy will falter. He will let go. He will not pay close attention to what's going on. He will not be a good guard over himself or, or over others. Another idea in this pasuk, even though it appears to be repetitious, there's a difference between Devarai and Amarai. In the Torah, whenever it says Vaidaber and Vayomer, what's the difference? He spoke, he spoke. In Hebrew, there's a big difference. Devarai are harsh words. Amarai are softer words. There's a need sometimes to give rebuke softly. There's a need to sometimes give rebuke harshly, depending what was done. Shlomo Melech telling us, accept my words as I tell it to you, even though sometimes they may sound very harsh. It's for your good. Next pasuk. Al yalizu shomrem betoch levavecha. Do not depart from your eyes, keep them in the midst of your heart. Here he's talking about mitzvot and the musar. How do you not forget about them? You review them, you learn them. Anybody who does not learn halachot, not only will he not know what to do or how to do, even if he once upon a time learned it, if he does not review it, he will forget it. This is, this is important information. This is not a, a PhD that once you got your PhD in college, that's it. You don't have to review it, but you know what? I am told that in many, many professions, they make you take additional courses throughout the years so that you are up to date, whether it's in dentistry, or whether it's in any other medical field, you have to keep up to date of what the new technology is. They make you take classes. They make you attend a uh, seminar. seminar of sorts. So you're up to date. But you don't have to review all the volumes of information that you once learned. Well, part of it is because it doesn't always apply. They just wanted you to become knowledgeable and educated. But the Torah is not the same. Torah says, you need to review this all the time, all of this, because otherwise you will not know what to do. You cannot afford not to review, not to let, to, to just let go of all this information. That is one of the ideas of not letting your eyes off this information. Another idea of what Shlomo Melech is telling us is, he is concerned about, us, about our progress, about our spiritual growth. So he's going to talk a little bit more about other ideas that help us with our spiritual growth or what to avoid. He says, be careful. What did he mention over here? He mentioned the eyes. He mentioned the ears. Shmirata inayim that was naim. One has to be very careful to watch over his eyes and ears because they are agents of chet. Sarsure chet. The ears, the eyes are called agents of sin. Depending on what you hear and what you see, they can eventually lead you to trouble. So therefore, what does Shlomo Melech tell us? And have them observe words of Torah, even if you, don't all, if you don't understand every word, just by looking at the words of the Torah. Have your ears hear the Torah, and in this way, these agents of potential sin will become agents of mitzvot. Just by listening and by looking. That is why one of the first things one should do, if he wants to help a friend get closer is have him attend a class or give him a tape because once he allows himself and he's made a hard decision of willing to listen willing to come to class which is very difficult but once he's made that decision as I've explained in another class the light of the Torah will eventually penetrate and make a difference in him so introduce to him 
to his eyes and to his ears the words of the Torah. And his entire body will become an agent for mitzvot. Next pasuk, Ki hayim hem lemotzeihem ulechol besaro marpeh. Very famous pasuk. They are alive to those who find them and health to all their flesh. A doctor who's coming to treat a patient who has sores and wounds all over his body, he has to apply a band-aid and medication to every one of those sores, to every one of those wounds. So Muhammad says, the Torah cures. The Torah is not a bandage on every one. You don't have to apply it in every one. You just apply it once. You apply it to the ears. If you apply this one bandage to the ears, then the whole body will recover. All the sores and all the wounds will go away. All the maladies, all the ailments. That's what it means. For the entire body. It will cure the entire body. Why is this important for us to know? What does it have to do with people who are sick? Some people are sick in the mind. Really. Not sick in the physical body. Sick in the mind could be depression. Sick in the mind could be, uh, I don't know. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, temperaments that people have. They're very upset, angry, nervous. They're not really diseases. They're not really sicknesses. All sorts of... Uh, Fear, yeah. All sorts of, let's call them uh, certain feelings, paranoia, all of these things. Right, all of these things, the Torah has the ability to help one. I'm not telling anyone not to go to a doctor or to a professional to seek help for his problem because there is sometimes a need for medication. That's what psychiatrists are for. But what Shlomo is saying is this is more powerful than everything else. In other words, it could be that the best help for a problem is the individual himself. If he only knew how to help himself. If not everybody knows how to help himself, so they need assistance of doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists. And here, Shlomo says, the Torah can help you better perhaps, but depending on what the problem is. In any event, the Torah has that power to cure one physically, emotionally, and psychologically. The word, lemotzehem, that it Torah is like life to those who find it. The rabbis explain that what this means is depending on how much effort you input, that is how much you will understand and how much you will succeed. As the rabbis tell us in different words, if anybody tells you, Yagati, Umatsati, I worked very, very hard to learn, in Baruch Hashem I'm able to understand a little bit of Torah, you should believe him. If he says, Yagati, Velo Matsati, don't believe him. I worked very hard and I couldn't understand anything. If he says, Loya gati umatsati. I didn't work nothing at all, and I understand it. You should also not believe him. <laughs> it's not possible. It takes yegia to understand the Torah. It takes effort, and nothing can be done with nothing can be understood without any effort. But once effort is applied, depending on the amount of effort, you can see great rabbis who have reached the the level that they have reached as a result of spending many many hours learning. I remember when we were in the yeshiva. It was not uncommon to learn 17 hours a day. It was not uncommon. Where did the other hours go for? A little bit for Shahid bin Han a little bit to, 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 to eat, and the rest to sleep. Who slept a lot? We had a, we had a goal. We only have a couple years to go before we get married. And after that, the diapers. The diapers are, are not going to let us have too much free time. <laughs> I'm using diapers as one example. All the, you know, all the things that come with kids and the wife and all that. Who has the time? So those who were serious spent as many hours as they can learning Torah. And it pays off. All the yigiyah, all that hard work pays off. Next pasuk. Mikol mishmar netzor libecha ki mimeno tetzot chayim. Keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. The point over here is that one of the things that has to be mostly watched more than anything else is one's heart. That's what he's saying over here. In other words, Shomo Melech says, I spoke to you a lot about your ears, about your eyes, I spoke to you about the importance of, of studying this Torah, but more important than anything else that you have to be careful with is your heart. Why? Because in the same way that the heart is the most important organ in the body, because it supplies the blood to every part of the body, life depends on the heart. In the same way, one's spirituality, how much progress one will make depends on his heart. 
What does the heart mean, spiritually speaking? It means that one's attitude, it means one's temperament, one's mood, one's feelings, and one's desires. Everything coming from the heart. We would think that the brain is king. The truth is the brain should be. It should be the king. That is why it is so high in the human body. It's in the head. It, is the, it should be the king. It should master one's heart. But the reality is that the heart many, many times, too many times, controls the brain. And not only does it control, the brain goes along with the heart. And it plays lawyer. How? By justifying everything that the heart wants. Right? That's how they become friends. But the reality is that there are two opposing forces. The brain is supposed to be logic. The brain, the brain is where the neshama is. The neshama is the captain of this ship that we call the, the body. And if we allow the brain, but not only the brain, obviously it has to be according to what the Torah dictates. Because one may have his own ideas that he learned in communist Russia. That's the brain too. No, we're talking about the brain, a healthy brain with the right ideas. Nevertheless, this healthy brain has to struggle with the heart that has all the desired feelings, desires, feelings, moods, and attitudes. So he says, be careful more than anything else with this heart. That you have the right attitude, the right disposition, that you show excitement. Let not your kids, Chaz Shalom, ever see that you're not excited to do something that is called a mitzvah. You're not in the mood to help someone. Be very, very careful with this attitude, with what you demonstrate, because not only do you, are you going to lose out here, the kids are going to lose out too. Attitude is very important. It controls our relationships, husband and wife, friends, depending on your attitude, your mood, and your desires. If you have too many desires, you're going to be selfish. You're not going to want to do what your spouse wants. I mean, after all, most fights have to do with selfishness. Very simple. If you really cared about the other one, you'd be unselfish. You do anything for them, almost everything, anything. At least you would listen and be considerate. But sometimes they don't listen to your heart, or your mind. Obviously, yeah. Like it, it, love. It's it, a, right. oh, I love you, I love you, but you didn't think. Right, you have to use both. Even, even in yeah. business. Right, you have to use both. And that's why Shlomo Amir says, be very careful with this heart. Protect this heart. Because it will make a difference in the mitzvot. If you will perform the mitzvot, if you will do them with the proper kavanah, or if you will be lax about it. The heart is so important that in Kriyat Shema we say, Don't go after what your heart desires and what your eyes see. So the commentary is asked, but wait a minute, how is a sin performed? First, by what the eyes see. It should have said, First, why does it say first by the heart? Isn't it usually the eyes see something, and then you feel like doing something, why does the Kriyat Shema say the opposite? Don't go after what your heart desires and then after what your eyes observe. Usually the eyes observe first, and that's what leads one to sin. And the answer is very simple. Had you not had the idea to begin with in your heart, you would not have allowed your eyes to wander around. And I'm not going to look there, because that's not a good place to look at. But people are curious, people look around, and that's where that's how they get into trouble. What are we gonna do if I'm in the business, fashion business, things like this? You know, I go to the show. I go yeah. To so you have to be extra careful. That's not always the best business to be in. Yeah. I was in Mexico in, in a factory of uh, women's clothing, and all the magazines there of all the fashions were very not sanua. And I, and I told the guy, "What do you? How do you deal with it?" And he said, "Hashem yirachem. <laughs> Hashem should have pity on him." <laughs> but uh, I don't know if that's a good enough excuse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. Anyway, if you have that kind of a business, let a woman run that department. I think that's the best solution. You just make operational decisions, perhaps. Rabbis tell us in Pirkei Avot, There's a discussion amongst the Chachamim Pirkei Avot. What should a person work on? What should he choose to work on during his life? What's the most important thing that he should concentrate on? Various opinions, rabbis express different ideas. But the, the conclusion is, we hold like Rabbi Lazar. Rabbi Lazar says, left tov. One should work on his heart. If he can develop a good heart, then everything else will come too. A good eye, a good attitude. You want to be a good friend. In other words, all the good things that are expressed over there, that one should acquire or be, can be done 
if you work on your heart. In other words, if the heart is healthy, everything else will be okay. If you have a good attitude, you develop a kind heart, then you will be a good friend, you will see things positively, you will have a good eye. And that, that is the importance of protecting this heart. Everything, so much depends on this heart. Next Pasuk. Haser mi mechai kishut peh ulzut sefatai marhek mi mekai. We're talking about things to avoid, things to be careful with. Right? We talked about being careful with the eyes, the ears. And now he says as follows. The English translation over here is put away from you a dissembling mouth, a corrupt mouth, and perverse lips put far from you. I don't always like these translations, but it's just to give you an idea of the, what the meaning of the words are. In other words, one has to be very careful with a crooked or corrupt mouth, with lying, with speaking lashonara, anything that comes from the mouth. Having a clean tongue, not using nivul peh. The rabbis speak out very strongly against those who are using nivul peh. How would you say nivul peh in English? B uh, what is that? False, false words. No, 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 no. One who uses uh, foul, language. foul language. Thank you very much. Foul language. Or as we say in Spanish, groserias. Whoever knows that, what that means. But that's the only word I can think of. But nivul peh in Hebrew. The Gemara says whoever uses foul language all the time, and I don't have to tell you what foul language is, just open the radio, any station you want, and every third word is a foul word. Right? And anybody who uses that kind of words, the Gemara says, even if he has a good decree for the next 70 years coming to him, good years, they tear off that good decree just because he has foul language. Koreim lo! shivim shana that he was going to have of, of tova because he uses bad language so be careful with your mouth be careful with saying la shonara be careful with how you use your mouth be careful with what words you say all of this is what does this have to do with anything we're talking about preserving the growth of this individual he's learned a lot of chokhmah and torah he's acquired a lot of musar but people some people are very have a very loose tongue is that what they say in english that's the loose tongue be careful. You can, all the good that you've acquired, you can easily lose. Another idea that is expressed in by the commentaries is that be careful what people have to say about you. In other words, if people say something that's very bad about you and it's wrong, correct them. You don't want to have a bad reputation. You don't want to have a bad name. You don't want others to badmouth you. So if you can do something about it, do it. But be very, very careful with this powerful organ called mouth, the tongue. A lot of harm can come out of it. A lot of good can come out of it too. So if you want to elevate yourself, preserve all that you have accomplished, be careful in the area of your mouth. Next Pasuk. <laughs> let your eyes look right on and let your eyelids look straight before you. In other words, focus on the Tachlit, focus on the goal of life. What's life all about? If you don't know, find out by learning the Torah. After all, it pays to find out what we're doing here for 70, 80 years. And it's not to play golf and to go on weekends and to just enjoy the good food and the weather. There's something more about life than all of that. And a Jew needs to discover that. Everybody should discover what the purpose of life is, what is his mission, what is expected of him. And therefore, in order to attain that goal, stay focused. Once you know what that goal is, stay focused and don't become distracted. Because life has many temptations and many opportunities to become distracted. So, look straight ahead. You want a, you want a good example who, who doesn't look straight ahead and because of that we experience some delays and problems because of them? Did you ever go on a freeway and it was full of cars and it was slowing down and there was no accidents and you wonder what's going on? Now there's all sorts of possibilities and I'm not going to tell you all of them right now. Uh, but one of them is really, really uh, a problem in, in many areas, and that is people are looking to the left or to the right because somebody is fixing his tire, some car turned over, there's an ambulance there. What are you looking? Go straight ahead. But because of all these people looking, that's what slows down the traffic a lot of times. So if you ever wonder why you're slowing down, maybe a half a mile down, somebody or a lot of people are just looking. Because they're looking, they have to slow down. Because they slow down, you have to slow down. So because of all these people peaking, we have to suffer. Right? So Shlomo Melech says, Just stay focused on where you have to go. 
don't be distracted. It's very easy to be distracted. There's a lot of things in this world that can easily take away your time and your money and you won't accomplish what you're supposed to accomplish. So stay focused on the goal, on the matara. <coughs> Problem is, people cannot stay focused because they're always looking at what people will say. What is he going to say? What does he think? Don't take in consideration what everybody has to say, otherwise you won't accomplish anything. The Rabbi says in the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin that one of the signs of Mashiach is coming that Pnea Dor Kipnea Kelev, the face of the generation will be like the face of a dog. Face meaning the leaders. Why like a dog? It's not only talking about the chutzpah that a dog has. The commentaries explain what does a dog do when it runs? It always looks back if anybody's going after it. That's the nature of a dog. The leaders of the generation will always look back to see what others have to say. They will not have their own ideas. Whatever they do, whatever they say will depend on what the voters have to say. What their top superiors have to say. Don't consider what everybody has to say, otherwise you won't do anything. Obviously there are times to consider what people have to say. But not at all the times. Because otherwise you won't accomplish anything because people have a variety of opinions. And you're only going to get more confused. Therefore stay focused on the matara. Stay focused on the tahlit. One who knows what he has to accomplish, it helps him to stay on course. But still he needs help because there's things that will distract him. He has to be reminded not to be distracted. Rabbis tell us in the Midrash, it also means over here that your eyes and heart should stay focused when you're praying. Not think about your business or anything else, but stay focused and turn to Hashem and close your eyes to be able to concentrate a little bit better on your prayer. Next pasuk, very important pasuk, Pales ma'agal raglecha, v'chol derechecha yikonu. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be firm. Pales ma'agal raglecha, if you straighten your, your ways, your feet, everything will fall into place. If a person is honest, straight, he has clarity, you know, was he straightens himself out in life, in his conduct in, with human beings, with other individuals, in his family. If he's very straight and honest, and basically does go straight and not crooked, then everything in his life will go just right. Hashem will lead him to where he needs to be. His feet will take him to where they need to be. He won't get messed up. You want an example of somebody that got messed up? Shimshon Agibor, Nazir, Kadosh. How did he get messed up? He went by what his eyes see. And he fell in love with Dalila. Now even though Hashem led him to, in that direction so that Amisa can take revenge from the Pelishtim, nevertheless, she was not his soulmate. She was a non-Jew. Had he not gone by what his eyes sees, had he not been attracted physically, had he really weighed things properly, then he wouldn't have fallen into this trap. So if one follows the path properly, goes straight, then everything will fall into place. He will not make mistakes. In other words, Pales Magara Glecha Shlomo Melech is telling us a very, very important piece of information here. If your life is straight, you have Bitachon Hashem, you trust Him completely, you do things properly, you have no reasons to fear that you won't accomplish what you need to accomplish, that Hashem will not put you in the direction that you have to go, that you will, stu you will stumble. No, call the Rachecha Yikonu. Everything will be just right. One who is careful with eating kosher, he doesn't have to be concerned that he will ever make a mistake, that something unkosher will enter his mouth. Hashem won't let that happen. Hashem will protect him because he protects himself. Hashem helps those who help themselves. You don't help yourself, you're not careful, then why should I perform a miracle? Why should I show you the way? One who is honest, straight, does things properly, then his feet will always lead him in the proper path. Ramam talks about another idea in Pales, talking about characteristics that we have to work on. Some people have to work on their temper, some on their stinginess, some on some other problem. He says, don't go to the extreme. Don't let them go of it overnight. It's impossible. If, you, if you're stingy, don't start giving all your money away. Give a little bit of tzedakah every day, and eventually you'll come to middle ground. In Judaism, the middle ground is always the best way. No extremism. No extre don't give all your money away and don't hold all the money for yourself. Be the middle. You have to get upset and angry sometimes. You have to control yourself. 
But don't, give, don't, just, don't just give in all the time, don't get angry all the time. Middle ground. Therefore, you want to aim to be in the middle. Don't go to any of the extremes. And that is why the, the next pasuk is, is a similar idea of Altet Yaminu Smol Aserak Dechamera. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left, remove your foot from evil. Judaism does not tolerate right or left. There's only one mitzvah, there's only one Torah. There's no, are you a rightist or a leftist? No. There's no such a thing as modern orthodox according to the Torah. Either it's acceptable or it's not acceptable. That's it. There's no middle, there's, there's, there's no compromise here. There are of course certain leniencies, and there are certain areas where you're allowed to be more strict and more lenient, but very, very, very little. People have taken the liberty to create all these uh, ideas that are not compatible with the Torah, and that is how reform began. Conservative followed. You cannot move right or left from what the Torah says. So be careful when people try to introduce compromise. And especially when it comes to evil. From evil, you have to completely stay away at all costs. Television is an example. Somebody tells me, I'm only going to let the child see good things. If there is something bad, I'm going to tur turn the channel. But at that split second, the child may have seen something not clean. What does this compare to? I once asked a lady who wanted to have a TV and just watch the good things. Let me ask you, would you buy a dog that the owner tells you he, he bites once a week? <laughs> Only once a week. The rest of the time he's okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what happens. The TV you know, will control it, but just once in a while the child will see something no good. Is it worth it? Does it pay to have it? How much control do we have over it? Today it's not like in the 60s, in the late 60s, early 70s, where we were watching on a Sunday for a little bit. What did we see? The, the Three Stooges? Hogan's Heroes? You know, they didn't have all the junk they have today. Today this is it's very dangerous to have a TV in one's home, besides the waste of time where his child is being exposed. He already has it in the street. You want to have it in your own living room too? It's a, it's a bitul Torah for the men. For the men it's, it's a waste of time. Upstairs they're going to go up. They're going to ask, did you set aside time to learn Torah? I didn't have time. But every morning you had time to read the gossip in the calendar section of the LA Times, right? You had time to read the sports section, the business section. For all of that you had time. You didn't have time to learn Torah. The TV, the internet, these are distractions that we were talking about. These fall under the category of ra, of evil. Aserak lecha. Completely let go of it. There are no excuses for it. If you want to see a good movie that is... Put it in a monitor, a video or something, and present it. I mean, there are ways and mediums to present something under control uh, settings. But otherwise, be careful, because children eventually grow up, and they are mature and adults, and you will have less and less control over them at that point in life. While, it, while you still have control over them, you decide what kind of a home you want to have. And Shlomo Melech makes it very clear. There's no compromise. In certain areas, there's no compromise whatsoever. And you have, we have to know what those areas are, and we have to draw the limits. But a Jew who's not informed, who's not learned, who's never taught himself anything, obviously will have a much more difficult time. And when his child comes back one day from college with a shiksa, you know what a shiksa is? A non-Jewish girl. And his dad and his mother said, what happened to you? Didn't we educate you how important it is to support Hadassah Hospital in Israel? What does that have to do with Judaism? Since when, Daddy, are you so concerned about Jew Judaism? You weren't observant of Shabbat, you didn't keep kosher, you didn't go to shul, you didn't learn Torah. She's a nice girl, he's cute. What's the big deal? Or they'll convert. But, you know, obviously these things are unacceptable, but it's hard. And I have a whole tape on that, on the one who is in love. It's very difficult to get him out of that love unless his love for Torah is much greater. And the only way we can increase the love for the Torah is by being an example ourselves, by drawing the limits, by not being compromising about certain things that are totally unacceptable, that which falls under the category of evil. And that's the message of Perek Daled. We have, we have so much to preserve, so much to accomplish. It will be chaval to let go of it, to lose it all. As the Pasuk says, Mi aleh behar Hashem, mi akubim kom kocho. The commentaries explain, who will reach the height of the mountain where Hashem is. Very few. But those who have gotten there, who will remain there? Some fall behind and they fall back. It's so hard to get up there. We work so hard. 
we have to pray and, and ask Hashem for assistance and do whatever we can to make sure that we stay there forever, Hashem. That's the